just said um, good morning. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, before we, we get to the text today, just two, two more announcements. I um, wanted to let you know um, on April 14th, that's a Thursday. It's the Thursday before Easter. Um, we're going to have a Monday Thursday service here uh, in the sanctuary, um, remembering uh, the last week of Jesus's life going into Good Friday. And we'll, we'll remember his last supper with the disciples and even talk about Good Friday a bit before we enter into to Easter Sunday. Um, and, and we do that in part, we'll, we'll, I'm going to mention this in a moment, but we'll, on Palm Sunday, that's the Sunday before that Thursday, um, that whole week, we'll, we're going to remember what Jesus did, who he was, and how much he loved us. Um, there's value in walking out that week and not just rushing towards the empty tomb. Remembering it challenges us to remember who we are and why Friday and Sunday are so important. And, um, and so we hope that you'll join us for Palm Sunday um, on April 14th, that Thursday, for Monday, Thursday, and then for, for Easter Sunday as well. Um, and then also, um, one, one last announcement. Um, we've had... Um, Several folks come through recently who have had uh, families that have had little ones. And I was reminded this week, I made a new friend. And um, at Starbucks, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, Y'all know I love that place. Uh, and she had like this, this little, tiny little baby. It was, she was adorable. And um, it was a reminder to me, again, I was talking to her about church and everything. But um, we don't, we need some help with our care for the, the littlest of, of our kiddos that come through. Um, and right now you might look around like we don't have any babies right now. And that's true. We don't, but we need to be prepared for when we do. And so um, Becky um, and I are just asking if you would be willing um, to just be on call. This isn't something that we're going to need every Sunday at this point. Um, perhaps at some point we will, but right now it's just kind of like an on-call thing. If somebody shows up with a little one, that we have some people who are ready to help them. And so if you're, if you're willing to do that, um, could you get with Becky or myself, and I can, I can refer you to Becky, uh, um, but we would really, we'd really appreciate that because we, we want Living Legacy to be a place for all people. And um, in order to do that, we have to be ready to receive them all. So, okay. Um, our text today, uh, Mark chapter 11. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. Mark chapter 11, um, and uh, we're going to look at verses 12 to 25. We're actually skipping over a portion of the text, um, verses 1 to 11, because that's our Palm Sunday text. And um, so we're going to, we may not, I, I just realized I didn't notify the, the team that I switched. So we may actually have the Palm Sunday text in here. So uh, Kevin, if that's the case, don't worry about it. We're just gonna we'll just go with our Bibles. Um, if you have a phone, grab a just type in Mark into Google Mark uh, eleven twelve to twenty five, and it'll pull it up for you. Um, or your your print Bible, you can use that a Bible app, whatever you got. So, um, but we are gonna save the Palm Sunday text for Palm Sunday. Um, but interestingly, Jesus or Mark spends. The last, a third of his book, a third of his book, concentrating on the last week of Jesus' life. You know, I thought about trying to rush through um, the text and get to where Mark addresses Easter week by Easter week. And then I realized if he decided to spend 30% or like 33% of his book on that entire last week, we should do it some justice by not rushing through it ourselves. And so we're going to take some time and continue through just as we've been doing. And, um, but we're going to pull out that text on Palm Sunday and we'll pull out some of the texts around Easter and talk about those individually. But we're going to continue through and really work through this book and not, and not rush it because it must be really important. It must be really, really important this last week of Jesus' life, which we're entering into now. And so this is a text that follows through where, where Jesus does that triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the last week of his life. And now we're coming to um, the following text, starting in verse 12. Um, 
where, where Jesus is with his disciples. And so let me go ahead and pray for us. Um, you know, I think about Paul sometimes and um, think about, man, he was just so amazing, so like capable. Um, and in our, our community group, we're working through the book of Acts. And what we've realized recently is that Paul felt very unqualified, um, ill-equipped, and at times maybe even scared. Think of him being real bold and like tough, and, um, but even scared sometimes. And um, I was thinking this morning about that as we were singing that last song about needing God. And Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 4, um, in verse 13, he said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He knew he could do nothing on his own. But with Christ, anything was possible. And this morning, if we come into this time and we just think, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to pick up a few nuggets or tr truths and then I'm going to go home and feel better, that's just not going to cut it. Because we can't do anything of value on our own. But if we come in here and say, you know what, I don't have what it takes, but I know that I need Jesus. And so I'm going to trust Jesus to provide Himself to me this morning. Then the sky is the limit with what God can do during this time. And so Lord, so as we begin, as we continue, but begin our time in the Word, um, let's pray for what we just sang about. Um, Let's pray that God will give us what we need to want Him more, to love Him more, and to receive from Him all that He has to give us today. We pray with you. Father, um, we do confess that we come to You too often with our own, in our own strength, with our own desires, our, our own intentions, um, our own plans. And um, we know that that's just so wrong. And I think probably to a certain degree all of us are doing that this morning. And um, so we would just humbly ask as we begin that you, you, might, you might break our hearts and um, soften us so that um, your Spirit could move in us today and teach us things that we need to learn, remind us of things that we've maybe unintentionally forgotten, or maybe just intentionally try to put out of our minds because we don't want to deal with them. And Lord, we pray that um, as we're sitting um, under Your teaching today, we're, we're bathing ourselves in Your Word, that Your Spirit would make it alive and change our hearts, change our lives, so that we could be all that we need to be for You. Please do what You will for your glory today, and for our good in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, so um, beginning in verse 12 of Mark chapter 11, Mark writes this. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, he entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. 
And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. So we have this scene. Jesus and his disciples are headed toward Jerusalem. And in this apparently random way, Jesus gets angry at a fig tree. I guess he's hungry. I mean, it says he's hungry, right? And um, talked about Jesus being fully God, fully man. So in youth this morning, so Jesus got hungry because he was human. So he gets hungry and um, he, he goes to the, he comes upon this fig tree that has leaves upon it and appears that it would be in the stage of fruiting, right? Where it should have some figs. And when Jesus gets closer, he realizes that this tree that presents itself as being full of fruit is barren and has no fruit at all. And in response to finding the tree without fruit, Jesus almost appears to act out of character. Um, he kind of seemed he seems to get kind of frustrated, maybe even angry at it. And his response to the, the tree leading him astray, is to curse it, right? With those words, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, Jesus very rarely appears to become angry or heated. In fact, one commentator mentioned that this is the only miracle of destruction in the Gospels that Jesus does. The only miracle where he destroys something. And um, so, so this isn't like a common thing, right? It's kind of an isolated event. Generally, we see Jesus being very gracious and and favorable and loving and and giving to those who are in need and those He's serving. So as I read this, the Spirit begins to stir in me. And maybe He's stirring in you. And um, saying things like, um, saying things to me like, John, I don't want you to miss the point here. Like, there's more to this than than meets the eye. Um, And it reminds me as I... I don't, I don't know if you've had that experience with this text or maybe with others that you've read in the past where you read them and they, they just don't seem to fit with what you understand or what the Spirit has taught you about the Lord. And so it kind of, kind of causes, some, causes some unrest maybe in, in your spirit. And, and this text certainly has done that for me. And um, it reminds me as I, as I come across that of John 16 where Jesus says this, starting in verse 12, He says, I still have much to tell you, but you cannot bear to hear it. However, the, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak what He hears and what He declares and will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify Me by taking from Me what is Mine and disclosing it to you. I'm not sure that the Spirit really necessarily reveals like new truth to us, right? Um, But um, He does help us to understand and apply established truth that we don't understand or don't know or have trouble applying. And sometimes with texts like this, I read them and I have the sense that there's something more to what I'm reading Occasionally, I get a proper understanding right away of a scripture text, but a lot of times I read a text and days will go by, months will go by, even years will go by, decades will go by, and it'll just kind of stump me. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, um, but I have. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure you have. And, but I know that like what I'm reading and what I think may normally be like an interpretation that isn't just the right thing. There's more to it. There's something more to mind there. And I think this is, this is kind of what Jesus is telling us. The Spirit sometimes doesn't reveal all truth right away. But even like this morning, like we were in youth group. This, that was like, you guys give me a perfect illustration. They started asking all these like deep questions, right, Tracy? Like really deep questions. Like how can Jesus be both God and man? Like, how does that work out? And what were some of the other ones? I don't even know what else you guys asked. But they were like, how does it work that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus looks to the Father to give Him direction in what He's to do, yet they're all equal? 
Good question. And so, like, we, I, I, I'm just so thankful, and I encourage them, keep asking those questions. We might not always have the answer, right? But keep asking those questions, and don't ever be afraid to ask the Lord those questions. But we might not get the answer right away. There might be days or weeks or months or years in between when we have them and when he gives the answer. Sometimes we may never get the answer. But we know sometimes that there's more to it, just like because they knew there was more to it. So they're asking these questions. And that, even in that, is the Spirit instructing us. The Spirit teaching us. The Spirit taking us deeper in our relationship with the Lord. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And so Jesus comes to this, this place and He does this apparently uncharacteristic thing, cursing this fig tree. And the disciples hear Him do it. But then they just move on. And at, at first... I think that seems kind of out of place. Like, there's no point to it. It's just like this passing, like, cursing uh, of this, this fig tree, and it seems kind of unnecessary. Then the next scene, we see Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem, and they enter the temple, right? And, and as they enter the temple, they see some things going on that does not at all please Jesus, right? So um, they're exchanging money for a profit. They're selling these animals, these doves, um, to be used as sacrifices probably for a prophet. They're taking this place that was reserved for the Gentiles to come and engage the Lord in prayer, and they're using it as a place to sell things. They were like inside the temple selling things and not allowing these people to come there and, and be with the Lord. And, and, and it makes Jesus angry. And so He flips these tables over and He pushes these people out and he, he just gets really, really angry and animated. And I think he gets upset because of the immediate situation, what they're doing there, but also because that is just something symptomatic of a much larger issue that's pervading the temple and the life of Israel. See, God had created the temple for several reasons. There's a commentator named Albert Rowland, and he identified six reasons for, for the temple being in existence. And he said they are these. The temple was a place of sacrifice. The temple was a place um, for the consecration of persons and things. The temple was a place for remembering the law of the Lord. The temple was a place for remembering uh, the law of the Lord. I had one in there twice, so I'm not sure what the sixth one is. I apologize. <laughs> the, the temple was a place for the revelation of God, and the temple was a place for prayer and praise. Now generally, the temple, most generally, if you look at all of these and you kind of want to boil them down to, to something, um, the temple was a place where people of all nations could come to meet with the one true God who had created them and everything else in existence. They could draw, it was a place where they could draw on this earth where they could draw close to God. God's provision was that in order for that to genuinely happen, they had to do it in His way. And, and God's way was, is, and always has been contrary to our natural human way of doing things. God's way is outlined in several Old Testament texts. Uh, the way that we are to draw near to Him, but maybe Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 really highlights that for us. And there we find these words, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. In other words, if you focus on the Lord. If my people, God says, focus on me and my ways and worship me according to my design, not according to what they want to do, but according to what I tell them to do, then they will be blessed. But in Mark's account of Jesus and the disciples entering the temple that day, who were these people focused on? They appear to be focused on the Lord because they're selling doves for sacrifice and they're exchanging money to make these things offerings and other things happen. But if you really pull it back, those people aren't there for expressly that purpose. They're there to make money. They're there to do business. They're corrupting 
this place. They're there for themselves. These people have perverted the purpose of this place and in so doing revealed the disposition of their hearts. So their actions made clear to many on the outside that they appear to be a holy people devoted to the Lord. That they appear to be honorable and faithful followers of God. They were actually merely leafy fig trees without faith. They had the appearance of faithfulness, but not the practice. And so just as Jesus cursed the fig tree, He now curses those who are only God-fears in appearance, but not in substance. He flips over their tables, and He pushes them out, because this was meant to be a place of prayer for all people. Which reminds me of another teaching of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6. And there Jesus says this about having merely an appearance of holiness and righteousness. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others and be seen by them, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. On this day when Jesus comes in and He sees what is going on in this first court, the court of the Gentiles, where these Gentiles who have come to worship God and commune with God are having their place of worship robbed from them by people who are wanting to better themselves, make money for themselves, and are taking advantage of what these people were given in this court. Jesus turns everything over and in a sense kind of curses what they're doing and says this is not going to do. And then He sits down and He teaches those who are there who will hear. Then, then, then He and His disciples, after He's finished, they, they leave the temple. They're on their way out of the city. And the disciples come upon this fig tree that Jesus cursed earlier. That was just in full bloom without any figs. No fruit, but it had all of its leaves. And they find that it has withered and died. And they point this out to Jesus. And Jesus' response to them is to tell them that if they have faith in God, they will be able to tell a mountain to cast itself into the sea and it will do it. This is likely an idiomatic saying of the time referring to faith, not so much that Jesus was actually saying, if you tell a mountain to go into the sea, it will do it. He's talking to them and, and really trying to encourage them that if you believe, these things can happen. They saw Him do it earlier and they didn't think anything of it. It was like, that's kind of weird. But they didn't actually think that the tree was going to die. And Jesus says, if you have faith for Me, there's not going to be anything that's impossible. When you pray for something, it will happen if you pray in faith. Because I can do anything. I can do anything. But if you don't, if you don't pray in faith, even if you look on the outside like you're a person of faith, you won't be heard. Because God will know. Faith is more than an outward appearance. It's a matter of the heart. So the fate of the fig tree and the money changers will be the same for all who come to Jesus with the outward appearance of faith, but inwardly are self-focused. Just as Israel had been representing themselves as the people of faithfulness on the outside, but inside the temple was a very different story. And so Jesus says, look, when you come to Me in true faith, anything will be possible because you aren't trusting in, in the limited creation to do something for you, but you are looking and relying on the unlimited Creator, powerful God who can do all things. Currently, as a church, um, I think that we're doing a good job of keeping focused on Christ and making Him the center of who we are. Are we perfect? No. 
But many of you, and I think corporately, are making that a priority. You're wanting to look on the outside just as you are on the inside. And it's showing, right? Things are happening. I love hearing stories about y'all sharing your faith with coworkers or on Facebook or in your neighborhood or with family and you're inviting them into deeper relationship and it's just this beautiful, beautiful thing. It's fun to hear uh, our youth and, and adults and children wrestling with some deep questions about the Lord. It's a sign of, of, of your desire to know Him more fully and to be more intimately connected with Him. That's a good thing. It's fun to see many of you on each week at different times throughout the week, but each day praying for our church and our community and our brothers and sisters around the world, placing a higher importance on prayer. It's a joy to me for us to be able to gather together and as we begin practicing for worship or we're in a meeting, we're confessing sin together. That's healthy and that's good. It's a, it's a recognition that we're not what we should be and that we are hopeless to get there on our own. That's a, that's a humble posture. That's a healthy posture to have before the Lord. But as we've seen throughout history and right into today, congregations don't keep a close watch on this. They get comfortable and start cutting corners spiritually or start relying on their past spiritual successes or on their rituals or functions to be their ticket to pleasing God, they very quickly get off track, fall apart spiritually, and become a fig tree with leaves but no fruit. And I never want us to get to the place where that happens. I don't ever want us to, to get comfortable. We, we can't let this happen. Because Bill's not here. He's sick today. Um, if you know Bill, um, he's got the flu or something like it. Um, as he's always saying, it's not about us. That's why we can't let it happen. Not just because we... Yes, because... We have generations coming up who need to hear the gospel. That is true um, because out, we want to stay connected to the Lord. Yes, that's true. But at the end of the day, we need to do it because it's what He has called us to. Because it's what He deserves. Because He is our God and He deserves to get everything from us that we can give. He must be first. And we must work hard to make that happen. To do the... Mickey calls it like regular, normal Christianity. And I think it's a great way to look at it. It's not a lot of glitz and it's not a much glamour. It's, it's pretty basic. If we're not careful, it becomes rote. But it's super important. It's reading your Bible. It's praying. It's gathering together for community. It's worship. It's giving, it's serving, it's sharing. It's these basic things that we are called to do day in and day out when they don't appear to be making a whole lot of impact in our lives or in others. But we continue to do them. Not because we see anything happening, but because we are called to do them. And then you know what happens? When you do that with heart continually over a period of time, you don't feel like anything's changed, but then all of a sudden you look back and you see that you, that we, are not who we used to be. Like, how did that happen? And it happened because of Him. Because we're doing what He asks us to do and opening ourselves to let Him do in us what only He can do. It's a beautiful thing, but it takes a lot of discipline it takes a lot of faith. We can't stop doing those things as a church, but we also can't stop doing them personally. We need to be... We are not a program-driven church. Like, kind of by 
it's intentional, right? So we don't have a lot of things going on. I intentionally try to keep what we do very basic because the, th the things that we put out there to do are really important and we don't want them to get missed by having lots of other things to do. Um, Bible study on Sundays is kind of really important. Or Bible study somewhere. By the way, our church is not the only place where you can get these things. And if you're a member here, it's okay if you go to other places to get some of these. We're not like going to be upset with you for that. But we're keeping our slate of things relatively limited because the things that we put out there we want you to know are really important. Sunday mornings, like Bible, Bible study itself is really important. And Kevin's really good at it. Mickey's okay. Right? Bill's pretty good. Mickey's awesome. Mickey's awesome. Um, that's important. Community group is really important. And I know some of you are in community groups, some of you aren't. Some of you weren't real wild about community groups when we started them, I think, right? But I think those of you who may, all of us now have, who are a part of them, have come to see the importance of it. It's really, really important. You can't do this on your own. And here, we're not a large church, but even in this group right here, you don't get the community you need as a believer, as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need more. That's why we have community groups to provide that for you. They're really, really important. And we hope that if you're not in one, you'll consider doing that. Um, prayer is really important. It's like really, really, it's like, foundationally important. We offer these prayer groups throughout the week because we feel as a church, we need to have this foundation set right in, in the life of our congregation. We don't just do these to get things from God. We don't just do it because we're going through the motions. We really believe prayer is vital to the health of our church. If you're not a part of one of those, we really want to encourage you to be part of one. They're 15 minutes once a day throughout the week. And we have them at all different times of day. There's some in the morning, some in the really early morning. Right? Ramona and Megan are champions. <laughs> like, um, some in the evening. Some They're just kind of all throughout the day. In uh, different days of the week. There's one Sunday morning. If you're just here, right, you can come in a few minutes early and pray with us. But it's really important. We want to encourage you to be part of that. We as a church... And we as individuals have to be doing these things because if if we don't, we just look the part, but have no substance, and that can't be enough. Because if we only look the part, we're just dead or dying, and that can't be enough. Jesus wants so much more for you. He came to give you life, He said, and to give it to you to the full. Not just a little bit. He didn't just give you enough to look good. He really wants you to be good and produce good. If you'll let Him do it in you and through you. Jesus uh, closes out this text in verse 25. And some, actually, some texts include a verse 26 here. Not all of them do it. Because some early manuscripts have verse 26 and some don't. So some of our texts have 26 and some don't. I'm going to read them both today. He closes with this. Jesus says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Think about that. It seems really curious. God would withhold forgiveness? How does that work? And I think what Jesus is, is getting at here is if you come to Him just to receive forgiveness from Him but aren't willing to give it to anybody else, then what you are is a fig tree with leaves but no fruit. See, because when Jesus comes 
and changes your life through His forgiveness offered to you, when He forgives you, it literally changes who you are. And even though sometimes it's hard, we can't help but forgive others. And if we're not willing to forgive others, then that probably means that we haven't really been changed in the first place. Even if we're going to worship every Sunday and in a prayer group and reading our Bibles and and looking the part on the outside, inside there's still something missing. Because when God forgives us, we can't help but then go on to forgive others. Because He makes us into His likeness. He gives us His Spirit. So today, we, we live, we exist as Christians, as a new creation. Not one that just looks the part, but one that actually through and through is the part. A people who love God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a people who love their neighbor as themselves. Today, let's commit ourselves in faith to being a people who give God everything, who trust Him to give us the faith we need to fill us with His Holy Spirit so that we can love like He loves, so that we can forgive like He forgives, so that this world might know who He is through what we say, what we do, and who we are. Let us be fig trees that bear fruit. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank You today for all that you are and all that you do, we again confess that on our own we are not enough. And too often we have lived looking, trying to look like we are one thing, but really if people were to peel away who we are, maybe as a congregation, but particularly as individuals, they'd see something very different. But Lord, today we receive Your challenge. We receive Your encouragement. We receive the conviction of Your Holy Spirit. And we would ask You for the faith that we need to move those mountains, for You to move those mountains in our lives. To change us in such a way that You could be known through what we say and what we do and just even by the presence of that we keep, Lord, that that people just from being around us would know there is something different about us because we are Yours through and through. Please continue to work in us to make that happen. Please let us not rest in doing the things we need to do to allow You to work in us in that way. And may You get the glory through us as we live better as we live more fully for you. In Jesus' name, amen.